Most people have never seen an unaltered desert. opportunity to restore and protect our public lands in the desert southwest. These lands belong to you and me 
and are administered by federal agencies, the Bureau of Land Management, the BLM, and the Forest Service. The federal agencies basically rent out the public lands through what they call grazing allotments. These allow ranchers to graze cattle on our public lands at well below market rates. Now we're going to hear from three experts who are going to talk about how livestock grazing has Im impacted the deserts of the Southwest, the Chihuahua, the Mojave, and the Sonoran. Grazing started in the mid-1800s in most of the West and earlier in the Southwest, but these lands were open, vacant, they were government lands or not even owned by the government yet. There was no way to regulate grazing and every settler who came out here brought livestock, cattle, sheep, and horses with them and Congress simply allowed it to go on as a matter of convenience. Grazing didn't become limited on national forest lands until 1900 when permits were required. Um, on lands that are now BLM lands, most of which are grazed, permits weren't required until the mid-1930s. Grazing is the number one threat to biological diversity and environmental health in the arid southwest. Cattle are not from desert ecosystems. They're incredibly dependent upon water. And that means that in arid climates, they congregate around streams and rivers and our precious desert springs. And they destroy these areas, not just because of one day of grazing, but the cumulative effects of year in and year out of livestock grazing. These desert ecosystems, these springs and streams are incredibly important for hundreds of different fish and wildlife species. And many of those species are today endangered because of the effects of livestock grazing. In the 70s, Congress passed two more statutes and they recognized that grazing was one of the permitted multiple uses of the public lands. But they didn't know then what we know now, what scientists have uh, since come to understand, which is that livestock grazing causes irreversible damage to the, these lands. It has caused irreversible damage in some areas already. Ripple effects go all the way up through the ecosystem. So you have, um, for example, bald eagles, which may feed on the fish in the stream. If the fish are gone because there's no longer streams that flow year round, uh, then that's no longer a bald eagle habitat. Uh, if the cottonwood trees, uh, the big old cottonwood trees that uh, red bat, for example, depend upon for their roosting sites. In other words, they, they stay under the bark and big old cottonwood trees during the daytime. And those big old cottonwood trees are disappearing because they're not being replaced because all the young cottonwood trees are being eaten by cattle. Um, so we, we have cattle affecting things like bats. Wolves aren't found in the Southwest except for where they've recently been reintroduced. Well, why aren't they? Because they were shot and poisoned. Why were they shot and poisoned? The ultimate reason was often to support the livestock industry. There's also millions of acres of fragile desert grasslands that have been horribly overgrazed over the last century. And those areas today, rather than being a sponge that naturally filters in intense summer thunderstorms and slowly metering that water out, um, the water rushes off these overgrazed desert areas. And that makes erosion and flooding much more severe because of the effects of grazing in these desert grasslands. And a real factor that people forget about is dams. Um, most of the reservoirs built in the West, though they justify them for a whole host of reasons, like, oh, people go water skiing on them or something, but they're built primarily for irrigation. And most of that irrigation doesn't grow foods that we eat directly, uh, like lettuce or, or something like that. It's actually growing hay and alfalfa. Uh, every Western state the number one use of water is agriculture. And that number one user in agriculture is livestock production. If you're talking about the full cumulative impacts of livestock production, which includes the dewatering of streams for hay production, which includes predator control, which includes the pollution of our waterways by livestock uh, manure, which includes the trampling of soils and soil compaction. It includes the competition for forage. I mean, even things like butterflies and hummingbirds are competing with cows because the cows are eating the flowers that those uh, animals rely on. Um, it would be virtually impossible to eliminate all those impacts. And 
there are better and there are worse ways to operate a livestock ranch, but there are no ways to operate a livestock ranch that doesn't have damage. When you consider that those riparian areas only make up about 1% of the land uh, base in dry areas like Arizona or, or Nevada, um, and you consider that 70 to 80 percent of all wildlife species are associated with them. They nest there, they feed there, they live there in many cases. Uh, those animals then are negatively impacted by that shrinking habitat. And if you look at the list of endangered species around the West, you'll find that the vast majority of them uh, that are listed are animals that depend on these uh, riparian areas, on these seeps and wetlands. And that shrinkage of those seeps and wetlands is the main factor why they're uh, becoming extinct. And, uh, and we're doing it all to raise cows in the desert. There are other provisions in the statutes which would allow the agencies to take action. The grazing permit is not a property right. It can be revoked or uh, amended at any time. But there's a lot of political clout in the livestock industry uh, and a lot of inertia in the agency. Uh, and so usually what it takes to get the agency to take some different action to enforce provisions in the Endangered Species Act or the Clean Water Act is for concerned citizens and environmental groups to get involved, to talk to them, to tell them they're concerned about what's going out, on out there on the lands. Um, or if, if that doesn't work, to sue the agency to enforce those statutes. A few people are making a, a profit, a private profit, off of public resources by grazing their livestock on these lands. And they don't make much profit. Ranching is a marginally economic activity in a lot of these areas. So here we have great damage occurring um, at the expense of public citizens and the, and the taxpayers uh, just to benefit a few folks. It's been going on for a long time. As a matter of history, as I've said, uh, the law really has uh, provides us a way to end it now, and there are some lands on which grazing should be ended now. Most people have never seen an unaltered desert. The landscapes that we see today are severely impacted landscapes that are degraded, biologically impoverished landscapes. And they are not what they could be. They, not, they are not what they once were. And until we remove livestock from them, they are not what they will be again. We have a chance and an opportunity to uh, right a wrong. We made serious impacts to the desert environment by having livestock out here. We have an opportunity to, ch to change that. And we don't always have a chance to go back there are a lot of things that have happened in the past that we can't rectify throughout history. We could, for example, uh, buy out grazing permits on public land. It could be the last subsidy. It's the last subsidy we have to pay. But let's at least make it the last subsidy. Buy them out, get them off our public lands, and let this land be restored to what it could be. The Center for Biological Diversity, the Sierra Club, and other groups fighting for desert protection in the southwest have had significant victories in recent years. As a result of our efforts, over 300 miles of rivers and streams in the desert southwest have been protected from livestock grazing. The results have been really dramatic. The cottonwood willow forests have sprung back even in less than five years, and with them, the endangered species of fish and songbird that live in those forests and depend on those streams. Also as a result of our efforts, over a million acres of habitat for desert tortoise and bighorn sheep have been protected from livestock grazing. Now the desert tortoise has food to eat and is no longer at risk of being trampled by livestock. These are significant victories, but in the southwest this is just the beginning of protecting these fragile deserts from livestock grazing. A phone call or an email from you will make all the difference in our efforts to protect these deserts from livestock grazing and allow them to bloom once again.